we definitely had put a lot of work into architecting something that made it really easy to understand the same information, but in different systems. So, I mean, if you just take point of sale as an example, you know, like, and you just talk about generic attributes of a transaction, like, you know, you might have the date the transaction occurred, the time when it occurred, the day that it occurred, the employee that was responsible for it, the value of it, the items that comprised it, discounts that were applied on it. You can quickly see like, you know, how much data is there just in a simple transaction like that. And, you know, there was this, and there still is, there's this level of sophistication required in terms of like consuming that information and standardizing it so that it's readily usable and understandable. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Modern CFO Podcast. I'm your host, Andrew Seski. Today, I'm joined by Martin Chi. He's the CFO of Amica. Martin, thank you so much for joining me. Pleasure. Thanks for having me on. So Martin's joining me from Australia, and it's been an incredible 2020. Martin, can you spend some time explaining what you do and how your role has developed over the course of the last year and what Amica is doing to drive professional accounting integrations forward looking into the digital era? Yeah, definitely the, um, the role has evolved over the past 12 months. We've sort of gone from more of an early stage startup to, you know, maturing, you know, refining the business and the value proposition. The products that we offer have evolved and changed. And it's been a really crazy 12 months pandemic aside, like there's been a lot of development work happening behind the scenes. And in terms of, I guess, my role personally as CFO, you know, whenever you're sort of starting out, <laughs> you know, you wear a few hats, particularly as a co-founder, you know, like CFO is sort of like one, one title that's there. But you know, historically, I've been very, very product focused and product oriented. You know, I helped to develop and design the first products that we pushed out to customers back in the early days and, you know, now stepping back and allowing people sort of a bit more rain to control that, that process. And I guess if like, if I rewind, you know, let's say 12 months or, or even 24 months in terms of what I was doing, doing then and spending more of my time on then to what I'm spending more of my time on now, it's definitely very different. That same concern around cash flow is, is still there. I have to say that's always something that tends to keep me up at night. And at the moment, um, what I've tried to do is delegate a lot more of those things that I might have been doing traditionally. And, you know, my background is in public practice accounting. So I'm used to setting up systems and, and processes and, and leveraging technology, you know, where, where we can to sort of, you know, save a bit of time or give us, you know, better quality data to make decisions. And so like for, for me, you know, a lot of that like financial reporting and, and preparing reports and all that kind of stuff, you know, I've tried to try to relinquish and delegate to other people so that I can sort of sit back and, you know, be a bit more bigger picture. And I think that's been a really important sort of evolution of the role where it's like at the start, you kind of just have to do a lot of those things yourself because you, you don't have the money and you don't have the resources to delegate. So now I feel like there's an opportunity to capitalize on that a bit more and to have that time to really just look at things and, and understand what data might be telling you or, you know, how things are, things are operating on all fronts in the business. So Martin, why don't you tell some of the guests how you got acquainted with the company and your route to the role of the CFO? I think there's a really interesting path in this podcast, particularly about the role of where technology and outdated systems are actually intersecting. And the fact that we're having this podcast on different ends of the world is a, a great example. Uh, there are a lot of systems that are merging. There are a lot of tools that are becoming more available to even at the stage that you're in while you're relatively early company trying to disrupt a big piece of an antiquated system. So how did you get introduced to this discrepancy? And maybe if you could spend just a minute on where you see this company evolving into trying to connect a lot of disparate systems. I think that'd be really valuable to a lot of listeners. Yeah, so the company, it's been around actually for a while and, and 
you know, the first, uh, I guess, iteration of what we were doing, it stems from me working as a public practice accountant and my CEO, he was a banker at the time. And there was this uh, process around organizing finance, which was really, really clunky and, and antiquated and just deeply inefficient. And effectively, what it was, was the exchange of financial information. So, you know, like you go to borrow money and you want to borrow money for the business, you need to provide the business's financials and a whole host of other, you know, documents and information. And there's already an element of that, which is relatively automated and it's stitched up by a few larger companies where, you know, they can access your credit score and credit history and and all those sorts of bits and pieces. But nothing really existed in terms of the specific financial information about a business. And so what a lot of banks were doing is they'd consume that information in a really manual way, like you'd email them a PDF or worse still, you know, you'd hand deliver documents to them and then they'd give it to someone else. And, you know, they'd be like keying in the numbers into like this piece of software, which would then spit out a result. And it was just a really, really long time consuming process. And it was really error prone as well. You know, so our first idea was to basically see how we could automate that process, given that, you know, the likes of all of the um, sort of accounting platforms geared towards SMEs, and they were becoming very, very cloud focused. And a lot of them moving out of that desktop kind of style offering into pure cloud. And then you had pure cloud competitors emerging as well. And that sort of opened up this whole other opportunity where it was, okay, you can access a lot of this information without needing to print a report or anything like that and how much information could you really get with the right system and and the right permissions and it really made sense just purely from a time perspective and the efficiency dividend that you know might be gained just as part of that you know one, one small process and you know that's sort of where we started and we kind of went on a journey with that idea and that then evolved into okay there's this bigger sort of narrative around data being really readily available and all of these cool efficiency gains that you could get around wielding that data, you know, so not just it being originated and input into a system, but also having it in a really portable format where you could say that data exists in my accounting package. Why can't it exist in business analysis tools or a finance application or whatever it might be? And so that's kind of how it evolved. And the first step that we took towards integrations and dealing with different APIs, we were engaged to build a, um, an integration with a cloud accounting package and a US point of sale company. It was one of the first, um, or I think the first iPad point of sale company. It also, you know, point of sale industry was like very, very antiquated. It's like, you know, you've got to have a cash register and a FPOS machine and, you know, all this hardware. And it's like, actually, you don't need all that. It's like, literally, you could just do it with an iPad and some you know, nifty hardware attachments. And, and we kind of got pulled along that journey and exposed to really what was, what was possible. And there was this incredible, and, and there always has been a huge demand for, for quality information and data. But this was, you know, in relation to small to medium enterprises where traditionally, like, they just haven't had that opportunity even though, you know, in running their businesses, they were creating lots and lots of valuable data. So that's kind of how we got into the thing in the first place. So the modern CFO is absolutely data-driven. I think that one of the key aspects of the conversation we had just prior to hopping on our recording was around the environment that you're creating that is considerably better than the incumbents. If you could describe what is achievable with your product in place, with your team in place, I think that would be really helpful to differentiate the difference between just the existing incumbents who are utilizing this data and what kind of data you're driving while also creating just a better environment. What are the positive externalities of doing so? Yeah, so a lot of the traditional ways that people were sort of getting access to something similar is they would engage people and they'd kind of build a solution that was kind of like one for one and really bespoke, you know, so we definitely had put a lot of work into architecting something that made it really easy to understand the same information, but in different systems. So, I mean, if you just take point of sale as an example, 
you know, like, and you just talk about generic attributes of a transaction, like, you know, you might have the date the transaction occurred, the time when it occurred, the day that it occurred, the employee that was responsible for it, the value of it, the items that comprised it, discounts that were applied on it. You can quickly see like, you know, how much data is there just in a simple transaction like that. And, you know, there was this, and there still is, there's this level of sophistication required in terms of like consuming that information and standardizing it so that it's readily usable and understandable. And, you know, there's a lot of challenge behind how that's architected and and scaled. You know, like every system has their own API, they use their own terminology. Sometimes values are created differently. It's like got so many variables around it that that is the biggest and most challenging problem that we've had to solve. And I think in terms of point of differentiation, that architecture and the way that we've approached that problem, I think that's sort of unique to the market. And, you know, we're really keen to, to push on that really aggressively to see what it can do. And in terms of our product offerings specifically, integrations traditionally like have been really, really ugly things. And when I say ugly, like from a UI and a UX perspective, it's kind of like, you know, you you almost need a a degree in, in integrations to set some of the things up and configure them correctly. And so we put a lot of effort and thought into trying to make that a really easy and approachable process for just run of the mill business owners, you know, given that one you know, you can't expect them to be experts in that process. And two, you you don't want to also have to expect them to engage with a professional to be able to, you know, reap the benefit of that product or that process as well. So we definitely put a lot of effort and emphasis on making sure that our products are really approachable. And you can see that in the, you know, the style of branding that we have. It's kind of like, it's very data heavy, but at the same time, you know, we want these products that we have to be very, very approachable and easy to access. And, uh, you know, one of the phrases that we kind of throw around, you know, at the office is like data liberation. Like we liberate your data from, you know, whatever system you might have, because, you know, as a business owner that, you know, you have this information there, but it's just not always easily accessible. And we are really trying to solve that problem. So it's, you know, you can leverage the information that you have in a really, really easy way. Right. Arnie, you're saying the entirety of the modern CFO packaged it into digestible software for the average business to create at least mobilized data so that they can glean the insights that top tier firms are having. Is that a good yeah. way of putting it? Or can yeah, you- I think that's a pretty, pretty succinct summation. And the evolution of that is that not only are you given these insights by the data and all sorts of smarts can be injected into that. So you're automating the way that a lot of it is delivered to the person or or the system, you know, better still is automatically prompting them about things that they should pay attention to. But the next evolution is we actually offer the user actionable items or actionable steps to take based off of that information. So like an example of that being, you know, let's say, Data is telling you that, you know, on a Wednesday, you you happen to be quiet. And, you know, historically, like maybe you've put too many people on the roster. So it'll automatically say, okay, you know, take that person off the roster. You know, that's an actionable item that you can take that's presented to you. And also maybe it's something along the lines of, yeah, that's a low period, maybe uh, automatically offer discounts, you know, and that, that'll get pushed as an update through whatever app, you know, your customers might be using to place orders or your online menu whatever it might be. So like that, that's sort of the next, next step of where we want to take the product. So you're delivering institutional grade resources to the masses across the world. How did you find the process of leading a team through the last year? I know that there are a number of resources that you utilize, experiences in the past in your previous roles that you utilize but this has been, and I know this word has been overused, but it's been unprecedented. So if you take a truly unprecedented scenario and you have to lead through a very challenging team that's decentralized and separated and in early stages and technology driven, how did you communicate effectively? What leadership skills did you rely upon? And were some of those formed in your earlier days in accounting or were they forged during some of those, uh, you know, even the last year? 
Yeah, so I think first and foremost, we definitely have an amazing team and a lot of the guys that we have that are working with us, they've worked with us for a number of years now and, you know, we're really fortunate to have that and, you know, it's always a team effort in in all regards, you know, whether it's support or engineering or biz dev, you know, and that makes things a hell of a lot easier, you know, during times like this where there's a high level of uncertainty because you just can rely on those guys to stay focused and, you know, keep the team focused. I think fortunately for us, we're always in this really heavy product development phase. There's always a lot going on behind the scenes that, you know, not necessarily is something that is exposed to a customer by way of like a product or, or whatever it might be. So that there is always like a lot going on behind the scenes at the core. And we, not that we've never not had enough work to do, but, you know, there's always just so much work to do on all fronts. And, you know, like last year was definitely tough. You know, a lot of our customers, they took big hits and we, we had people wanting to, you know, defer things. You know, and and we really just had to stay positive and knuckle down. And, you know, like fortunately, the Australian experience has been quite different from the rest of the world. Like we we were affected, but, you know, definitely nowhere near as badly as, you know, let's say you guys or, or in Europe. So definitely that was something which it was just lucky to be in Australia. You know, but I think for us, we're developing new product and we're enhancing things and, it's like whatever was happening in the broader economy and the broader market macro wise, it's like, well, if you didn't have a positive outlook and you didn't think that this was going to be something that, you know, eventually was going to go away, then like, I don't know what the, I don't know what the alternative, you know, really looks like. And no one was going to stick their head in the sand and, you know, just like ignore it. But at the same time, it was like we had a full schedule of work to get through and, you know, we just kind of knuckled down and, and focused on that rather than, you know, looking at the things that were happening, which were outside of our control anyway. And, you know, we knew all other businesses largely anyway, were having that experience. So, you know, it just didn't pay to do anything else uh, except that. Absolutely. I was thinking back to a comment I heard. And one of the most fun parts of having a modern CFO podcast is just getting inside the heads of financial leaders. And I think one of the more insightful comments I've heard that just took me aback as somebody who hasn't been through at least one pandemic through their lifetime was that the world is only going to end once. Plan accordingly. If you're confident that this is the time the world ends, then plan accordingly. If you don't believe so, plan accordingly. And it was such a detachment from uh, the emotion that was running through all of the communities that we know and love, financial communities, technology communities, software development communities. And it was a, an interesting reset to take a look back and say, is this the time that we're going to be having to rethink if our business is going to be alive? I don't believe so. So we should begin to go back to work to figure out how to enable our hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of employees to feel comfortable enough to re-engage in a meaningful way while also being empathetic to the very real challenges that they're facing. And we're both very, very fortunate in the fact that we're in our startup community and the venture and startup world sort of almost relies on the fact that you're going to be almost essentially 100% dedicated to this core mission and, you know, global pandemic or not, pretty focused. So I really appreciate the fact that you took the time to describe all the things that were going on with the company and all the things that were going on with your clients, because it makes a big difference when you're going out to discuss even quarterly financials. So you're already in a precarious environment globally, and then the startup environment is even less predictable. And then you have on top of that, the role of reporting regularly. So with all that in mind, how do you keep the relationships so prosperous and how do you keep solidarity and vision with your team? Yeah, I mean, everyone is communicating very regularly, particularly leadership team wise, you know, that's like a, a fortnightly catch up and then sprinkled with ad hoc catch ups in between that, you know, we always try to make sure that there's that alignment, you know, with what we're trying to achieve and, and how we're getting there, you know, so, so definitely that frequency 
you know, pays. And I think one thing that we really benefited from in light of everything that happened is we were already, you know, a fairly flexible kind of remote style startup where if people wanted to work from home a couple of days a week, that was fine. And we're quite dispersed geographically. You know, we have a really great development portion of the development team in Poland, support out of the Philippines and the development team over here as well. And so we had already addressed a lot of those challenges where you were dealing with, you know, time zone differences and people working from home and how really to effectively communicate, you know, given all of those variables. And I think very, very generally, you know, when we're having our fortnightly, you know, leadership team catch-ups, that's like the, the kind of open forum where you just really frankly discuss, you know, everything that's going on, any concerns that people are having. And, you know, it just really helps to keep everything aligned. You know, and there's a lot of components to the business as well. So like particularly when you're gearing up for a fundraising round, that is a really big, annoying distraction for the business, particularly from the leadership team perspective, you know, when you're dragged out to do pitches or prepare materials, answer questions, you know, that, that is a really time consuming process that takes a lot of the focus away from, you know, the important things that are adding value to the business, you know, other than, you know, giving it capital, which is also incredibly important, (laughs) obviously, that's like always a challenging thing to be contending with, you know, at the same time that you're, you're, you know, you're trying to help your business grow and direct it accordingly and to, you know, really make sure that you're gearing it up for success. So as a young firm, you had a head start in terms of managing during tumultuous times. However, there are absolutely some operational challenges that just simply can't be avoided around the times when you're communicating your value to uh, potentially new investors and communicating across your team, which has been successfully decentralized. So what might be interesting to our listeners in terms of the leadership in the finance team would maybe be how do you balance your day-to-day in terms of your macro and micro perspectives of your maybe your one to two-year goals versus your five to seven-year goals? Because there are immediate challenges that every firm who's growing exponentially and providing value, especially in the software business, has to deal with. And then that growth obviously comes with operational challenges. And then at the same time, you're being finance on future profitability in the five to seven year, well, future profitability pending some of our recent IPOs, but we'll go into that another time (laughs) in the US on the New York Stock Exchange and and NASDAQ. But again, we can pop back into that. So uh, in terms of, uh, you know, your one year and five to seven year goals, what is exciting and what's really challenging operationally for you? I think finance team wise, you know, we're, we're incredibly lean. It's like effectively me. I've got you know an accountant that uh, assists me, who's really great, who works predominantly in the Philippines, funnily enough. And then I've got you know a sort of tax and compliance team that I work with here in Sydney, which makes sure we're kept on the straight and narrow. And look, I think fortunately as well, just given the business that we're in, and also my experience, you know, being a public practice accountant you're just able to to realize a lot of efficiency and just not require a lot of human resources to be dedicated to that function. You know, a lot of it just can be streamlined, uh, just leveraging off tech and, you know, a lot of things just can happen automatically, you know, whereas they, they might not have been able to, you know, let's say if you're rewinding maybe 10 or 15 years. So that sort of enabled us to be really lean in that regard, but still you know, sort of having access to quality information and and reporting. And the reporting side of things is always like a challenge anyway at the best of times with a startup that is changing and and pivoting. You know, like if I put together a business model like two years ago, like that, (laughs) the one that we have now, like the poles apart, you know, aside from just underlying assumptions changing, you know, like our products have changed, our pricing has changed, revenue models have changed. So there's just you know, so much change that's constant where you're always trying to spin things out that are relevant. And then, you know, a week later, they could be totally irrelevant. And you really need that speed to be able to access that information. And and that's incredibly challenging. You know, it's incredibly challenging. And I think 
that kind of finance role, it's just, and particularly at CFO level, it, it's just become so multidisciplinary now, you know, like traditionally and still obviously very deeply rooted in finance and accounting, you know, as a cornerstone. But, you know, now the breadth of that has just expanded so much given, you know, where the technology has gone and also the ability to be able to delegate a lot more through technology too. We discussed just a moment prior to hopping on the podcast a little bit about finding streamlined and even keeled approach to tumultuous times. And you had an amazing sports reference. I was thinking a little bit more about this in terms of finding a way to essentially reprioritize every single day with a very transparent ideology and vision. And I was thinking more about the way that that's actually conducted with the relationship between the CEO and the CFO. Financing innovation is always a struggle. So relaying all of that to the team is what you just described. And it sounds like in the startup world, which we are both endeavoring and trying to navigate, that it's almost as if there's a constant reprioritization process that occurs and that it can ebb and flow with great ideas, great new clients, international clients, and just a number of variables. And I think that that is almost a great analogy for the year that we've been through. It's almost as if the world was going through startup life and all of a sudden we're all trying to navigate tumultuous time and figuring out where we can ebb and flow appropriately. However, again, you had a great sports reference before we hopped on and finding your unique path to creating some stability there. And I think that'd be really valuable to a lot of our listeners to go into that, that sentiment. Yeah. yeah and, I, and I wish I remembered it. You know, there's this um, Australian cricketer and I remember the, um, the interviewer at the end of the, one of the matches was asking him like, what, you know, why don't you celebrate when you score a hundred? He just said, you know, like if I celebrate the highs, and you know indulge in the lows i feel like that affects the focus that i have on the pitch and you know that's something that it's kind of like a, a philosophy i guess that i have and also a general approach to life it's like well it requires a lot of energy to really live on those highs and also you know perhaps like indulge in the lows and just indulging in emotions just generally in business and particularly in startups like startups are such a roller coaster and and literally, it's like one day you're winning and the next day you're losing. And, you know, like going on that roller coaster, you know, you, you can develop a, a, a disorder very, very quickly. And I feel like, you know, as, a, as an important component of the role of CFO, it's like at times you've got to be the one that's just providing that sober opinion and perspective where it's much more grounded in the numbers and, and the data. And also just like trying to balance that, you know, like when I contrast my sort of attitude and approach to, you know, my CEO, like he's much more overt in, in the exuberance and celebrating the wins and, and that sort of thing. And, and that's really important, you know, for the rest of the team, like we need to be able to celebrate our wins when they happen, you know, but at the same time, you know, there's always something potentially bad that can happen on the other side or there's a loss around the corner. So it's always really important just to, I feel like have that perspective, but obviously without being a, a wet blanket, <laughs> <laughs> a wet blanket on things because you know startups inherently they are exciting and it's you know an amazing experience to be able to disrupt industries and be seen to be shaping the way things are evolving generally so that was something that kind of always always stuck with me and you know definitely something I think in my personal life where I'm like as well like I've got two young kids and definitely a lot of highs and lows and wins and losses in that regard and you know, like at the end of the day, a lot of these things, like you just got to get on with the job and get on with things. And, you know, it's just for me, sometimes it's just a matter of you just genuinely don't have time to get caught up in that emotion. I know that that level of stoicism and taking a moment to step back into a non-emotional role is paramount to the leadership that you have to give information out to everybody else while they're also dealing with everything that you just described, right? Every young employee is also going through that same roller coaster as a lot of the founders. It sounds like uh, you found a way to communicate effectively, not just from a 
financial strategy side, but also from an empathetical side, from communicating that, hey, we were early to be remote. We've already created an environment in which it's very profitable for us to be distributive, yet very communicative. So I thought yeah, I, that's really impressive. Yeah, I think, you know, as I, as I touched on earlier as well, we're really fortunate in the team that we've got. And, you know, probably selfishly, but smartly, we want to share some of that pain <laughs> across the team as well. So we, we are, I think, as founders and leaders within the business, quite transparent with the whole team. And that's a bit of a double-edged sword, you know, in, in a lot of ways, how much information you're exposing to people is such, such a delicate balancing act where, you know, people are performing a really specific role and a specific function within the business. And, you know, not that you necessarily want to limit the exposure to information generally, but, you know, you have to really understand the impact that that can have on people, whether it's potentially damaging to their focus or, or maybe it introduces a degree of uncertainty, which just, you know, wasn't there before and has some other ramifications. So, and I feel like that, that is like a really important element to always keep in mind as a CFO. You know, you're always collecting a lot of information and, and looking at a lot of data and how and when, you know, you, you expose that to people is really important because there's this really human, human aspect to it where once you say something, once you expose someone to something, like that can deeply and profoundly change, you know, the way that they see things or, or the way that they approach their work. I think if there was a single line to repeat over and over again in this podcast, that might be it. There is a human level and a a data analysis that has to be so well understood, so intimately in which that it informs strategy moving forward. And the role of the CFO has changed in which the fact that that data analysis is so much more rich than it used to be in the past. You now have to rely on both the human level and have a very, very good idea of what data is pointing to you in the direction of, especially in a startup where there could be a number of directions in which I could drive the future growth. So that all is exceptionally excited to me. I'm wondering a little bit about if there is something that you think that most people are overlooking right now or feel that is super underestimated. Actually, I'll posit this question. Let's take away from the company, away from the CFO role. Is there something in the world, you know, maybe not in your industry that you think people are wildly underestimating or you think it's going to be a big part of the future that could be in your vertical or maybe outside your company, but that is clear to you that may not be clear to everybody else from your specific vantage point? I think it's always sort of difficult to assess those things through a different lens, you know, other than, you know, my, my background and perhaps from the, the experience at the startup as well. But I think just that whole theme of data, I think everyone is really becoming a lot more you know, in tune and aware of the implications and the value of that, you know, whether it's, you know, financial data or or your own personal, you know, personal information, which we've relinquished a lot of that and probably even more of that during these times where, you know, you got to check in and check out and scan, like every every place that you're going to, you got to scan a barcode, you know, when you go into a restaurant now, you're ordering through an online ordering system, you're not even having to pull out your credit card out of, your, out of your wallet these days. So I think like as a general theme, that whole focus on data is becoming more and more, more and more generally, I guess, pervasive in, in, every, in every industry. More and more it's becoming accessible to, you know, the everyday person. I think that is an overarching theme that's affecting, you know, the world and affecting all industries. And I think the evolution of that you know, I like to think that we're also part of that as well. And something that I mentioned earlier, it's like you want to be able to, or we want to be able to empower people to understand, you know, that data and what they can use it for, how they can use it and really, you know, provide them with the tools that allow them to leverage it. Further than that, my personal belief is, you know, like AI and all of the kind of, you know, machine learning elements aside, which which are really going to have a profound impact on all industry as well. I mean, you're, you're already seeing it. That's going to create this whole other industrial revolution in itself. 
but I think just the way that uh, we're communicating with technology in general, like I think that is going to change really, really profoundly. Like it's funny as an accountant, you're just exposed. And like I think accounting as well has been an industry which has seen so much disruption and at the same time received so much benefit from tech. Like there's just a new app coming out every day of the week to save you time and, <laughs> and money, you know, and that, that is like really difficult to navigate through. But, you know, I, I think that's only really going to increase, but, you know, that creates this really, really complex problem of you don't have time to be an expert in everything. And so, like, all of these apps are coming out and they're hyper-niching certain, certain functions and processes and, you know, they have their own, their own opportunities and limitations. And, you know, like, one of, my, one of my core beliefs is that, like, that whole, if you can get rid of UI... <laughs> And, you know, deal with technology on much more of like a human level where you're just perhaps talking or asking questions or questions are just automatically being presented to you because they're relevant. You know, I think that's something which is really going to be really disruptive. And, you know, like I think, you know, we're already starting to see some normalization of that with the likes of, you know, Siri or Alexa and other sort of, you know, technologies which are making a lot of those things really accessible for people and getting people used to dealing with technology in that way as well. There's a fairly significant underestimation of how rapidly all of that's going to happen. Yep. Right. Okay. Yep. So I'm sort of, I'm going to give you a couple of rapid questions to sort of wrap up all of this. And I know that audience is exceptionally gifted to be able to look into your day-to-day -day life of being able to manage the new family and the uh, two young kids, be a startup CFO, drive efficiency for hundreds of companies and be able to continue to expand outward. So the last few questions that I'm going to throw at you are sort of more oriented to sustainability and more back to the sports reference of staying consistent and looking at being able to drive an environment in which you can ask the right questions before they're needed to be asked. So to me, that looks like, unfortunately, a lot of home setups and working from home setups. So uh, oh, man, how I'm are in, you working I'm in, out? I'm in a playroom at the moment. <laughs> there are a lot a whiteboard in the back. The yeah, absolutely. How are you thinking? How are you working out? Are there new skill sets that you learned over the past year that have helped create the environment? Are you spending just time with the... Uh, the young ones, can you give us a little bit of a picture into the mindset of the environment that you're creating so that you can perform at the level you are? Yeah, so <laughs> fortunately, um, you know, my wife is really great at sort of taking care of home life so that that kind of is a relatively limited distraction for me. But, you know, nonetheless, a very important distraction that, you know, you need to make sure that you're, you're not neglecting. And, you know, I really love spending time with my kids as well, particularly like this really young age, like my oldest daughter's, you know, coming on two and a half and the youngest is four months. So it's just like, you know, a really cool age where so much change is happening and, you know, you, you get a lot of love generally. You know, ba balancing things generally from like a, a work from home environment perspective. I mean, everyone's had, you know, those challenges and you just kind of have to do your best you know, <laughs> thankfully, like there's a, an abundance of kids materials there that sort of keep them entertained. But yeah, I mean, like in terms of the setup that I've got here, it doubles as a, a playroom, but it is kind of the home office as well. So, you know, like I've got a whiteboard here where I like to draw up a lot of things and just, you know, put a lot of thoughts out so I can just sort of sit back and think and sort of, you know, have that kind of like bigger picture focus. Um, but I do admittedly, you know, when I've got the opportunity to go to the office, I, I definitely take it, you know, cause it's just, you know, very important to have, you know, some segregation where you can go, yep, I'm in business mode and, you know, I just need to be able to focus on those kind of problems because, you know, they do require a hundred percent of your attention in terms of new skills. I mean, as a father of young kids, I mean, I'm used to, I was used to multitasking before, but like now at an extreme, <laughs> at an extreme level and, um, you know, just, just with reference to like, you know, trying to, trying to keep a level head and, and not, not get too emotional, you know, with, with kids, like you got to be that way anyway, you know? So like, I think that is like a really um, great skill to possess and to carry across, you know, in the startup world, 
because like it is it, it is incredibly challenging and every day is different and you're definitely the recipient of pressure from a lot of different angles whether it's you know investors or business partners employees potential potential customers existing customers so there's always some fire that's there you know that you got to sort of deal with from time to time so yeah i think that is just it requires developing a hell of a lot of patience you know and i just think that is so relatable you know that early stages of parenthood to you know an early stage startup like there just there are so many parallels to the challenges that you face in speaking with a number of cfos i've come to realize that it is a personality type i'm sorry to say what would you <laughs> what would you give as general advice for somebody thinking about rising to the level of cfo in the early stage company or startup environment i think really focus on those interpersonal skills and they, they talk about eq like i just think that's so relevant and increasingly relevant in this day and age like particularly in in a startup where it's so important that everything is working in unison and you know there's this real harmony between all the functions and you know you're dealing with all different types of people throughout the organization and you know for me it's it's slightly different you know also because I'm I'm a co-founder as well and it's very much a very heavy product focus to that role too but i think those interpersonal skills and those empathy skills they're so important in just being able to have access to information you know throughout the organization you want people to be really open and candid with you and you have to be an, an open book as well in that regard and as i touched on earlier you need to really understand people and how they're going to respond to being exposed to certain things to certain information to certain data to certain reports and and you really play such an influential role in that regard because it's like you start reporting on something and then all of a sudden like you know that that is an important focus for the business and fixations can develop around those things and you know then that really can shape behaviors which you got to really be careful about how that is managed overall so you know just having a real understanding and appreciation of that human element and understanding how profound that impact can be on the team you know you've really got to be careful with that and i think that's a really important skill to be developing you know aside from obviously all the traditional financial and accounting skills that you need as part of the role i'm not sure i could end on a higher note than that in terms of trying to find a way to balance the actual day-to-day role that your just pioneering in terms of creating efficiencies where they're so so broken and driving <laughs> forward a, a narrative of you know future CFOs to develop both you know, the skill sets that you've really aptly described as well as the the emotional intelligence that it takes to decide when and how to communicate effectively i know that this is going to be a podcast that Many should listen to maybe more than once, especially if they're considering the early stage uh, company positions that are coveted. And I know for a fact that we're going to have the opportunity to circle back in the near future. So I wanted to say thank you again, Martin, for spending time on the Modern CFO podcast. And I would absolutely love for our listeners to reach out if Martin would love to, you know, give a a brief way to find a way to reach him. That'd be fantastic. And I wanted to say thank you again for spending time with me tonight. Uh, th- thanks so much for organizing it. It's been really, really great to um, chat to you. And yeah, we're looking forward to a big year. Awesome. Well, again, thank you to everyone listening to the Modern CFO podcast. And I'll talk to you again soon. Thank you. Thank you.